Hello, I'm Lou. Welcome to this Westminster Abbey Q&A discussion with Dr Miranda Kaufman. That's following on from the lecture that she gave on Africans in Tudor and Stuart Westminster. To formally introduce Dr Kaufman, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Dr uh, Jamie Hawkey, canon theologian here at the Abbey. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Lou, and hello everyone. Good afternoon. It's lovely to welcome you here, at least virtually, to Westminster Abbey. You can see the Abbey's nave behind me, and I regret to say that I'm not sitting in a chair facing outside the west door. I'm sitting in my study with a backdrop, uh, but we very, very much hope um, that you'll be able to visit us here in person sometime soon. Um, I have the privilege to oversee our wonderful um, learning department with its wonderful and transformative work. Um, and it's a real delight to welcome this afternoon Dr Miranda Kaufman, whose lecture you've all heard. I want to say a particular thank you to her for recording the lecture for us and for being willing to engage in the question and answer this afternoon. Miranda is leading this masterclass, uh, which of course has as much contemporary resonance as it does historic importance. So you're very, very welcome to this discussion. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to welcoming you to the Abbey in person at some point soon. So I'm going to hand now back to Lou, I think. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so to all the students and teachers who are watching, um, thank you ever so much. You've sent in so many questions. We were flooded with um, questions. Um, I apologise in advance if your particular question is not put to Dr Kaufman um, today, um, but we have um, sort of assimilated as many as we can and we're going to go through as many as we can in the time that we have together. So um, first question up is from uh, Carius from Isha College. I'm just going to put my glasses on for this one. And Carrie Ed's question, um, Miranda, is this. Out of the 360 Africans living in Renaissance Britain, where does it look like the majority immigrated from? All right, thank you, everybody, and thanks for tuning in today. Um, and uh, I, OK, so let's just dive straight in there because there are so many questions. Let's try and get through as many as we can. Um, so. <laughs> The problem is that the, the nature of the sources means that we don't actually know exactly where the majority of Africans that we have records of came from uh, in terms of the fact that sometimes they're just listed with words like uh, ethnic descriptors like Blackamoor or Ethiop and it, it, Ethiop doesn't mean from modern day Ethiopia, it was used much more generally. Um, we, but if we look more broad, there are a few instances where somebody's, uh, it says they're from Guinea, um, so we know that was sort of the west coast of Africa. Again, some of these geographical terms were quite vague uh, or from uh, Barbary, or, which was what they called Morocco. Um, but if we look more broadly at uh, the way that Africans were moving around um, the world at this time, uh, we can see that Africans were coming to um, Britain with, um, Af with Eng English merchants who were trading uh, with West Africa and Morocco. That was one way that Africans could have come here. Some of them were coming from Europe uh, because there were larger black populations in Spain and Portugal and Italy in this period. Um, and, and those Africans had got to Europe, usually again from sort of North and West Africa. And uh, then when English people uh, capture Africans in privateering uh, raids on Spanish and Portuguese ships in the Atlantic, again, those um, Africans were being usually trafficked across the Atlantic. Uh, from an area known as Senegambia, so between the, the Senegal and Gambia rivers. So sort of broadly, I'd say most of them are coming from, from West Africa, but we can't always be much more specific. Although, you know, in the book we do, we do have, uh, you know, the Prince of River Sestos, so we know exactly where he came from. So that, that's something, modern day Liberia. That's great. Thanks, Miranda. Fantastic. Now, I have to say that um, we had so many questions um, from students who were really interested in John Blank's life. Um, obviously, you've told us quite a bit about John Blank's life in your um, presentation, but I really felt that there was quite a strong feeling of, but Miranda, what is your personal opinion on how he came to be in Britain and what happened to him next? Everybody wants to know what happened to him when he, you know, at the end of his life and how much light can you throw on that? 
Oh, well, none. <laughs> the, uh, there's no evidence. Um, I think uh, when I when I when I was writing the book and and uh, yeah, pretty much I have written everything I know in that chapter one. Uh, but when I was writing the book, um, there wasn't the earliest record I knew of about like locating him at the Tudor court was 1507. And so uh, although people had theorised that he'd come with Catherine of Aragon, of course, Catherine of Aragon arrives in 1501. So there's this gap of six years and you're like mm. and and uh, th I did find this other sort of Europe I can't even remember who it was now but there was some other sort of uh, European nobility who had been shipwrecked on the English coast so I thought that was potentially another another potential route but since then uh, Michael Hajiru found uh, this 1502 reference to John Blank playing at the funeral of Prince Arthur and so that ties the dates much more closely together so I do think that that even though we don't have a, a specific sort of uh, passport stamp on his arrival in Plymouth, uh, it's it's I think it is pretty likely that he came from Spain in the entourage of Catherine of Aragon. You know, as we were saying, there's a much bigger population, black population in Spain at this time, so so that makes sense. Um, and in terms of what happened afterwards, again, you know, he just disappears from the records after 1512. But hopefully, uh, people will do more research and maybe find things. Um, you know, as more and more records get digitised, it does become slightly easier to search for people. Uh, and the name the name does appear in, in sort of some other records from the London area, but you, it's just there's just nothing to sort of pin it together. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to give that annoying historian answer and say there's no evidence. So it's up to you to decide. Yeah, write your choose your own adventure. Write, 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 write your story of what you think happened to John Blank after he got married. That's great. Thanks, Miranda. Yes, I wonder whether one of the historians watching this session today might you know, give us some more answers in the future. Thank you. Right now we've got um, a question from John. Um, John asks, who did you find the most interesting in your research and why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting that you say everyone's really interested in John Blank, and I do feel like that's because we have a picture of his face. So I think that does kind of connect us with him. But, you know, I, as we as you saw in the lecture, we only have these fragments of his life. I mean, I I think, you know, whichever one I was writing about, I found the most interesting at the time. But I do I do have a soft spot for Diego because I think his life is just sort of so swashbuckling uh, and such a sort of you know amazing story of him sort of joining Drake and connecting him with the Cimarroons and then sailing around the world and you know again his sort of four years in Plymouth are you know a bit they, we don't have any we don't have any detail on that so again that could be another history homework write the story <laughs> write the story of Diego's four, 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 four years in Plymouth and what he might have got up to yeah you know, he might have gone off and fought you know in that horrible campaign uh, in Ireland but with Drake but that's another story uh, and I do think, yeah, Dedri Jakawa, Prince of Rizla Sestos, is a really interesting story as well. Um, especially because, you know, as a prince, he's sort of challenging those preconceptions of the roles of Africans in that period in, in England. And, um, you know, I just really like this moment where this East India Company merchant encounters him in, at River Sestos and is sort of bowled over by the fact that he can speak really good English. Uh, and you know, I like that kind of confounding expectations. Um, but they're all they're all great stories, and you know, do dive in and, and find out about them. Oh, when I say dive in, the salvage diver is a great story too. So uh, anyway, carry on. What's next? Just out of interest, just out of interest, Miranda. Um, did you have a whole load of characters that you you had to sort of cut for that book? And and if so, what are you going to do with those extra characters that you've researched? Uh, no, unfortunately, the reason that I chose those 10 was really because they're the ones we know the most about, where there's slightly more meat on the bones. Um, there, well, there was there was one that I cut because we couldn't be quite sure whether she was of African or um, East Asian origin. Um, I, yeah, maybe I should just put that on my website <laughs> sometime. Uh, but I, I have sent it on to some other scholars who are looking at that period, so who knows. Uh, and uh, actually somebody is researching the life of Harry Domingo, who was an adulterous highwayman in Aberdeen in the early 17th century. So that 
that would that's another great character that you know I didn't know much about um when I was writing the book but it would be it would be great if someone wrote uh, hopefully she'll write that up at some point as well there's more to be found there's more to be found in the archives definitely sounds that way thank you right lovely well the next uh, question comes from Eugenie in from Upton High School and Eugenie's question is in Tudor society did the African community preserve their culture or did they have to anglicise themselves to fit in? I think uh, I think again this is one where we don't have a lot of evidence to really fully answer that question and I know that's an annoying historian answer again but um, I think I suppose the records that we do have of baptisms, marriages and burials um, show that they were they were kind of anglicising themselves, but more importantly, they were Christianising themselves and Protestantizing themselves. And um, it wasn't just Africans that had to do that in order to fit into Tudor society. I mean, if you were not a baptised Christian, uh, you were not going to be treated as an equal in Tudor society. Uh, you wouldn't, you know, for example, you're not allowed to marry in the Church of England unless you're being baptised. And so you do find Africans being baptised a couple, you know, three weeks before before being married. So, so I suppose the short answer is that that yes, but it wasn't exclusive to to Africans. Um, in that, uh, you know, we also have records of of, of Jews um, conforming to the Church of England, like there's a Portuguese. There are several Portuguese Jewish families that that sort of ostensibly um, uh, kind of live their lives in the parish. You, know, you, you could be fined for not going to church. Uh, you know, and you, you have refugees from 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 Europe as well. And and you, so there's, I mean, and merchants and you. Know, it's, it's very cosmo. It's, it's, Tudor Tudor society is a lot more cosmopolitan than people sometimes imagine, especially obviously in London. But the second most cosmopolitan place was Norwich um, at the time. So so so. Yes, but I mean, we don't have that interior life. I suppose, I suppose, again, John Blank's turban is quite an interesting point to discuss on that is that was, you know, was he wearing that turban as a you know, ret retention of his cultural heritage or, you know, Henry VIII liked playing dress up. So, you know, Henry VIII was dressing up as a Moor or a Turk half the time. So, you know, we can't be certain, but, but yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Lovely, right. Now, the next question comes from Jenny from King's Academy. Thank you, Jenny, for this question. And your question was, um, do you perceive any sense of intersectionality in terms of the experience of Black Tudors? For instance, where does gender come into the mix? Were the experiences of Black men and women different, do you think? And did class come into play? You might need a bit of time for this one, Miranda, and you've got a bit of time. That's oh, right. Um, so I think intersectionality wasn't that something that I was thinking about very explicitly when I was writing the book, uh, which I feel, well, I, I'm not even sure I knew what that word meant uh, when I started, certainly not when I started doing the research in 2004. Uh, but um, I, we did, I did think a lot more about gender um, when I was creating the uh, Future Learn Black Tudors course. Uh, where we had a whole week on, um, it's available now, we have a whole week on uh, on women and gender uh, in week five of that course and um, of course you know of course there was intersectionality and uh, yeah Africans women's um, opportunities in Tudor society were much more curtailed than those of African men because they were women uh, and you know, English English women weren't having the best time of their lives most a lot of the time either. Uh, but so, for example, we find African men working independently as craftsmen, so a silk weaver, needle maker, or pursuing uh, kind of skilled roles like John Blank the trumpeter or Jacques Francis the salvage diver, um, or you know, working as sailors like Diego or John Anthony. Um, so they're able to sort of earn, earn, earn a living in those ways uh, and travel the world and, um, you know, have that independence. Um, whereas the women we encounter, you know, are much more uh, like, you know, much more likely, well, not more likely to be in domestic roles, but they are in domestic roles. Uh, and possibly Anne Cobby as an independent woman in Gloucestershire is relatively unusual. I mean, there are there are women who so. So, you know, there are women who inherit um, 
small legacies in the wills of their former employers, which gives them an, a measure of financial independence. Um, I, and, uh, you know, I was, there's also, a, we, as we talked about in the lecture, Anne Cobby, uh, you know, is able to make quite a lot of money for herself um, through prostitution. Uh, but I, I again, I, I think that, um, you know, that sometimes gets read backwards. So there's more evidence of African prostitutes in the 18th century and that often gets read backwards. But actually, there isn't a huge amount of evidence of um, African prostitutes in this period. So I don't want to sort of overemphasize her experience. But um, I think that tackles the gender side of things. And class, again, I mean, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, as one might expect, um, you know, in the it's sort of in the same ways as as you know, are you know, are we have issues? You know, there are intersectional issues in our own society, um, but I think that um, uh, so so for example, um, Prince Deliri Takawa um, comes with a lot of sort of cultural capital, uh, as do several of the other Africans coming here from directly from Africa with English merchants do tend to be princes or sons of um, sons of sort of uh, you know higher ranking people in their own societies um, and um, you know when the Moroccan ambassador and his entourage show up they're obviously treated as ambassadors um, where and uh, you know and again but if you if you had a, a skill uh, like John Blanc or Jacques Francis then you uh, you were treated in a certain way. You, you were able, you had that gave you opportunities. But if you had uh, been captured from a Portuguese ship by a privateer, you didn't have anything. Uh, you were coming, you were coming here with nothing, and 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 that would obviously affect your your sort of life chances. Um, yeah. Right, I mean, right. there's so much more one can say on on that, but but I think that that will do for now. I think you've definitely covered that. That that's fantastic. Thank you. Lovely. Now, we did touch on religion just a couple of questions back, but we did have um, two questions, um, one from Lucy and one from Soliana, uh, two questions that are kind of very similar. So Lucy's question, were all black Tudors in England Christians? And Soliana's question, are there any records of Africans in Tudor England who followed a faith but were not Christian? And I know we sort of touched on this a little bit, but could you just expand that a bit more for us, please? Um, yeah, so again, sort of not a lot of evidence, um, at, but um, again, looking, you know, what, what, what we know about um, religious practices in, in North and West Africa, and we know obviously that there were large Muslim populations there, but also um, people who would have had more kind of animist faiths. And uh, so, so we, I, th I suppose we can assume that, you know, people brought those, that knowledge and those religious um, ideas with them, although if they'd arrived as young children, then they maybe might not have had, like, for example, Mary Phyllis. But I mean, it, it depends, you know, how you define it. But, but um, so, so when we have records of baptisms, especially if they're adult baptisms, then then we can kind of posit that that they had those other faiths kind of in their in their hinterland. Um, and uh, again, there's this debate about John Blank's turban and whether that uh, reflects any uh, uh, a kind of maybe a, a, Mus a Muslim past. But again, he gets married in 1512. So by that point, he must be a Christian. And he certainly sort of words his petition for a pay rise in 1509 in, in Christian terms. But, you know, again, like as we were saying earlier, you, that was what you had to do to sort of get on. Uh, the only other point of faith that is that... Um, there were these several um, African servants in the households of these Portuguese conversos uh, or Jewish uh, merchants. And so uh, it's plausible that, that, that they might have um, also sort of uh, followed the Jewish faith um, in private um, at home, even though ostensibly you know, conforming to the Church of England. Fabulous. Thanks, Amanda. That's great. OK, and um, a question from Chester School now. Uh, what forms of discrimination and racism do you think Africans in Tudor England faced? That's another big question, isn't it? <laughs> um, again, the evidence that I look at is not not as kind of illuminating as it might be um, in that, you know, that, um, but 
Uh, and I think that this is again something that I didn't really get to the bottom of in my book. And I think this is an area where historians need to work with um, literary scholars. Um, you know, there's a long uh, history of uh, of people studying Shakespeare, for example, looking at Othello, but there are many other black characters in early modern drama um, exploring issues of race and racial ideas forming you know, in that literature. Uh, and I think now it's important for you know the next generation of scholars to take um, that the, the, the things they've learnt from looking at the literature and put it alongside the more quotidian um, pieces of evidence of the, of the sort that I've looked at, like parish registers and court records. And I mean, I think that um, again, something we we thought about um, making the future learn course was. Um, you know now you know we again we sort of talked so much, I, I think my understanding of racism um is deepening hopefully as as the years continue and keep thinking about it and all of the discussion over the last year particularly very intensely um but it's i'm quite interested in this definition of the difference between structural or institutional racism and interpersonal racism and so um, I think that what I've found about the way Africans were treated by the law and by the church in Tudor society, you know, might go towards an argument that perhaps there wasn't any like institutional racism established at this point, uh, partly because there was a very small African population. It was a new thing in a lot of ways. And so there wasn't hadn't been time for the institutions to kind of react. I mean, there wasn't. There wasn't even an official um, conversion ceremony in the sort of Book of Common Prayer, I think, until the 17th century, late, late in the 17th century. So they kind of cobbled these adult baptisms together from you know, the infant baptism and, and uh, the, when you had to rehearse your creed and things, uh, I think confirmation or something like that. Um, so I think, yeah, looking at this question, it's interesting to make that distinction between institu institutional racism and interpersonal racism. Uh, but, you know, I have looked at things like um, wages and there, there doesn't, you know, John Blank seems to be uh, being paid similar levels of wages to the other trumpeters at court. Uh, there are these opportunities. Um, and I think, uh, going, uh, uh, yeah, and I think and I think that um, you, uh, you know, when you compare um, the experiences of Africans in Tudor England with what happens later in British colonies and in um, l later centuries in England, you can see that you know there were that, that things weren't quite as bad, perhaps. So that right, right. Well, it's interesting how you ended that answer because actually we have a, a whole raft of questions from students who are particularly interested in sort of how we get from the picture that you paint of what it what the experience of Africans in Tudor England was like, how we get from there to the whole period of you know the 18th, 19th centuries and slavery. So um a question now then from Hannah. Hannah from Sheffield Academy asks, um, she says, you stress in your presentation the equality seen in society through religious and legal acceptance of Africans in England in the 15 and 1600s but you allude to a change in attitudes and status by the 1800s. When, why and how did attitudes change? Another big one there. So when, why and how did attitudes to Africans change? Well, a lot of work has been done on Africans in Britain in the eight, long 18th century, but not a huge amount has actually been done in the 17th century. So my research sort of finished in, for my doctorate in around 1640 um, I sort of took it up to the Civil War period uh, and a lot of other uh, scholars kind of start maybe in the 1660s but they they kind of quite quickly get sucked into the 18th century because there's more evidence and there's a lot to say about the 18th century so uh, I think uh, there's actually a, a PhD student um, currently in Lancaster who's doing her PhD on Black Stuarts so she's Kind of, I think that 17th century period is really where we need to look really carefully at what was happening in Britain, um, what you know, how, how to to really pinpoint the how, the when, you know, and the how and the why. Uh, well, but I, I think at the same time we do have more of an idea of the why, uh, particularly um, from uh, scholars of the Caribbean. So. Um, I'm actually looking at Caribbean history more now, and I've been reading a lot about this and. Um, uh, you know, it, Barbados is very much sort of seen as the the, the sort of um, 
what's the word? Not, not the melting pot, the crucible of a lot of these uh, sort of institutionally racist um, measures. Um, so Barbados is one of the earliest sort of, um, colonies. I mean, Virgi Virginia is founded in, in 1607, but um, the English get to uh, Barbados in uh, 1627. Uh, but Barbados bec becomes um, a society with a large number of enslaved people faster. And it's where the first sort of slave code is is written at, uh, in 1660, I think. Uh, and uh, you know, so that that it's so I think that a lot of the answer is to do with um, the way that enslavement emerges in these early colonies, and it, I I think it comes from immediate initially an economic motive that uh, enslaved labour you know, proves to be the most efficient way of producing um, these labour intensive crops like sugar. Uh, and then, but then the experience of living in that society and that, that is brought back and, and quite early on Africans then become, are being brought back to London and England from those colonies by their enslavers. And so that that experience of, of living alongside, living in a society where Africans are enslaved and um, demeaned in that way, obviously, you know, changes the way they're perceived. Um, and, and but you know, there's still more work needs to be done as to how that evolves and and how it. Most importantly, I think a lot of work has been done on how it evolves in the society in those Caribbean islands or in early America, but not so much has been done on how that plays out in England. Um, but I mean, I have I've recently seen a, a 1647 will made in, in England, uh, leaving uh, two enslaved men to the man's brother, uh, but they are living in Barbados. Um, but, but you know, so that it, it's, it, it happens quite quickly, I think, uh, in the, you know, sort of the middle years. If you look at, if, again, if you look at British involvement in, in trading and trafficking of enslaved Africans, uh, there's there's really not a lot of activity until the 1640s, and then suddenly, if you look at slavevoyages.org, which is a massive database of all those voyages, uh, it this, it just goes up sort of exponentially. I'm probably not using that what term properly, but it goes up a lot from in the 1640s and 50s, and sort of really takes off um, uh, from that point. So so that there's a big shift, you know, it, there's a big shift. So I think I think that, um, you know, enslavement and colonialism is is the why really um, a lot of the time, certainly for the institution. Yeah, for, for yeah, I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> but more more research and discussion needs to happen on that. Great. And you've given us a fantastic tip there of a website, slavevoyages.org, I think you said, Miranda, which sounds like a really good one for um, students to sort of get their teeth into and, and have a look at themselves. Thank you for that. Um, uh, so Zara from Harris Westminster wants to know, under which monarch from the previous centuries do you think Africans experienced the most equality and why? Uh, I don't think we can really answer that question because I don't think that the change of monarch has that much impact on institutions or the way people view each other. Uh, it's not that neat. You don't say, "All right, the new, the new, <laughs> there's a new king. We're going to treat people differently." Um, and uh, so, so I think we have to think more in in shifts over time in a much broader way. So, in that case, then, would you suggest then, from what you've researched already, would you suggest that under the sort of the general Tudor period, then, um, that Africans experience more equality than any other? Would you think, in the past, or? Well, I'm increasingly hesitant to sort of try and argue that that, that Africans ever experienced equality. Mm. I don't. I'm not sure that's the right term to be thinking in because you know because partly of all the things we've already been talking about with with intersectional prejudice and things. And although although uh, you know racism as we know it today didn't really you know, exist in those terms in that you know, ideas about race have evolved over time in a lot of different ways um but clearly there was prejudice and there was intersectionality as well in that 
you know, in the book, I talk a lot about you know class and religion being more, you know, the more the main sort of ways in which people were judging each other. But obviously, if the somebody, I think, you know, if you if somebody were to encounter someone with darker skin in the street, questions might be raised in their mind about whether they were a Christian or not, or where they came from and what what you know how much class they had. I mean, that would obviously depend on what clothes they were wearing. And lot you know, there's lots of other factors that people take in when they make snap judgments about each other. But yeah, I'm not I'm not sure it's the right. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure quality is the right lens to be kind of approaching the question through, really. Great. Great. Now, um, a lot of the questions that we've had so far, Miranda, have obviously um, focused very much on the topic that um, you did your lecture on, which was you know, fascinating. But we also had loads of questions from students about your work as a historian, you know, your methods of, of research and that kind of thing. So I think we'll do some questions now on, on that sort of whole area. Um, so we'll start off with Hall Hallie, who wants to know what sparked your interest in this topic? Uh, my mind wandered in a lecture. And <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I was in this lecture in my last year of university and it was about early modern trade and it was pretty boring. And then it, suddenly my ears pricked up because the lecturer said that the English had started trading to Africa in the 1550s. And I just had never heard about that. And, you know, I was obs I'd been obsessed with the Tudors since I was about nine and I had ne never, ever heard about that. Uh, and, you know, whereas, you know, the only time we'd been taught about trade with Africa was in the context of um, slaving in the 18th century. So I, you know, I went to the library to try and find out more. And then I quite quickly found references to Africans actually in England, but the more, but there wasn't a lot of material about it. So that's when I needed, I decided I had to find out more. That's brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Miranda. Great. Um, Freya asks the question, what specific sources, either written during the Tudor period or modern, did you find the most useful for finding information on Africans in the Tudor period? Um, well, I do like to go back to the primary sources. Um, like I said, when I went to the library in 2004, there wasn't a lot of secondary material. Um, since then, there are a, a couple of key books that, I mean, the, what the original key book was Peter Fryer's Staying Power, which is sort of before David Olashoga, uh, the first kind of really big overview of black history in Britain, going back to sort of before the Romans um, and coming through to his present day of the of the 1980s. And there were a couple of uh, pages in that book on the Tudor period, which had really useful footnotes. Um, so that was really helpful. And since I started my research, you know, several other scholars have written about this, uh, specifically Imtiaz Habib, uh, but Black Lives in the English Archives um, that came out in about 2008. And um, Onyeka Nubia has written two books now about Africans in Tudor society. Uh, and so those are obviously really important now if you need to, if you want to look at books. But in terms of, and they're both, you know, very rich and detailed. Um, and uh, th but the uh, in terms of um, primary sources, uh, in if you if you want to, to in order to get a sense of the the population and how widely spread the African presence was across Britain, then parish registers are the most useful. But they are very brief, uh, and you can supplement the bit with tax returns. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be as much material about Africans in tax returns. Uh, but in terms of the most interesting. Uh, it's got to be court records, legal legal records, because that's when you get more of a story. Uh, you get you get detailed sort of depositions, sometimes from the Africans themselves, talking about whatever it is it, that that the court case is about, and that's where you can kind of really get a bit more detail. I think. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. OK, um, we had an anonymous question. I think it's a really interesting question. How does your work challenge typical? or dominant portrayals of black people in history? Um, well, I think the two quite simple. The, the, bit, the headlines are they were here and they were not enslaved. I think I think those are the main the main thing. I think a lot of people assume there were no black people in Britain until the 1940s after the Second World War. And then people tend to assume that all Africans in European history were powerless and enslaved um, and it was more complicated than that. Fantastic, thank you. 
Now, a question from Chester School, who asked, um, what was the initial response to your book, Black Tudors, being written by a white woman? Well, um, I think there's always lots of different responses to these sorts of issues. Um, I think, and it depends who from. I mean, in general, I got a really positive response to my work altogether. Um, you know, a lot of nice book reviews and people interested in 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 it. And I think so. I think a lot of people were kind of overwhelmingly just interested in the topic, and they hadn't necessarily heard about it before, even though some of those earlier books had already come out by by black scholars, actually, um, Imtiaz Habib and Anya Kanubia. Um, and uh, but but because my book. Uh, was a trade book and it was aimed at a popular audience and I also tried to work with schools as well um, to uh, to really kind of bring it into the classroom in an accessible way. Uh, I think the story got out there widely but I would also say that obviously I think you know as a white woman and as a sort of Oxford educated, uh, privately educated uh, woman I had uh, opportunities to get my foot in the door to get my book out there and to spread the word in a way that um somebody somebody from a different background might might not have found as as straightforward um and that's why i think it's very really important that i'm you know not the only person to be talking about this and to continue the dialogue and to bring other people into the conversation and i hope that i've brought the topic to a wider audience and therefore you know a wider more diverse group of the next generation of historians can can come to it and find more and and reinterpret it because uh people you know they're, they're, they're although I've, I've said well firstly you never really know what people are saying behind your back um but thanks to the internet you can sometimes find negative comments in horrible places but no there was uh, there was somebody who accused me of cross racial ventriloquism uh, partly because of those opening sections to the to the book where I sort of try and imagine something from the perspective of the person I'm writing about. Um, so I think that, you know, inevitably anybody coming to source material will, you know, have um, biases that you know you, you can't always sort of put to one side or, you know, that you try, you try to be, you know, I was taught that as a historian, you have to be objective, but increasingly I think that's impossible. And it's more important to uh, declare your biases at the beginning <laughs> to try and like, so I think, I think I'm, you know, I'm really interested. There are, you know, younger students coming through here and, you know, and I am really interested in talking about the material with others and seeing what other perspectives there are, because, you know, maybe I got it all wrong. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned about you know the future generations of historians um, and so we did have also lots of questions thinking about the future of the study of black Tudors and the future of teaching diversity in the curriculum so um, if I could ask you Anna's question Anna asks how are you hoping your book might be used in the future and she says you know do you think it would be an important thing to be taught in schools or do you want it to inspire other authors to write similar works about parts of history that have been overlooked and ignored Oh, well, all of that sounds great. <laughs> well, you know, I don't want it. I don't want it pulped or um, used used uh, in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> I um uh I well, I, like I said, I have been working to get it into schools, and I yeah, this this is part of that grand plan. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everyone. But uh, yeah, I have a project called Teaching Black Tutors. I've been working with educational publishers and teachers and. Um, we've created teaching resources, uh, mostly aimed at key stage three, um, but but there are increasing you know evidence that it is being taught in schools, which is great, and I'm doing my best to sort of support that. And um, you know this future learn course that I've mentioned a couple of times, it's a six week free course that anybody can sign up and do. And I'm hoping I know that a lot of teachers have actually started doing it, and and that's I think really helpful because. Um, one of the barriers to black history being taught in schools is that teachers don't feel fully equipped to do it because they weren't taught it themselves. And so that's why I'm hoping you know, that, that 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 could be a model uh, and Future Learn is very open to um, doing more courses in this area. So I think that could be a model where um, if you do create these short courses and um, there's a new one on uh, the colonial countryside, um, country houses and enslavement coming up. Uh, but, you know, if you, and there is a, the black curriculum have done a course on teaching black history on future learn as well. So I think um, that's one way to 
and that you know, of course I want people to follow you know that example and get get more black history into the classroom in you know all periods and all topics and yeah I definitely hope that um you know I think I think I think that this was, people think they knew the know the Tudors and this was a part of Tudor history that people didn't know and I, I hope that that encourages people to challenge everything they're told and go back to the archives and find new stories because they're there you know and it, it depends what questions you ask of the past but um, I'm excited to see what people find next. Definitely um, and on that and I know we've only got a couple of minutes left Miranda but um, where do you think research on Black, tu black Tudors should go next? Um, well like I said I think there's, there's definitely um, so, you know there's definitely some important work that needs to be done uh taking the archival evidence that has been uh, brought together recently by myself and uh particularly MTS Habib and Anya Kanubia and trying to marry that up and the conclusions we can draw from that alongside the, the literary evidence and ideas about race in in the literature to try and get a a more um, blended kind of 3D idea of what that experience, what what the African experience was, and how how people, you know, as much information as we can get about what that lived experience was, and I did what ideas were circulating because, you know, it is you know as some of the questions have referred to, you know, it is so important to try and understand how you know the racism we're still lumbered with today evolved and came to being because if we can understand how it where it came from and hopefully we could it well that will help us combat it now um but i i think that like i said we'll see that there's a lot more digitization so there's more research it should be a lot easier to find things in parish registers and other source material by using keyword searches in a way that hasn't been possible uh but there are sometimes you do have to go back to the archives i think someone should go back into the high court of admiralty records uh, because i think there's going to be a lot more material in there that very badly catalogued uh and like i said you know expanding into the Stuart period as well and making those those contrasts as well but i'm sure people will have lots of other ideas that i haven't thought of and i look forward to seeing where it where it all goes next fantastic well I'm really sad to say that time seems to be up on our Q&A and Miranda we know that you have a book to um, to carry on sort of researching and writing so um, I'd just like to say on behalf of Westminster Abbey how grateful we are to you for giving up your time um, today um, and for your lecture which was absolutely fascinating and all the insights that you've given us today and also the opportunity that you've given to students to sort of connect with you in this way just asking their own questions in their own voice which I think is, a, is an amazing thing to be able to do I certainly don't remember having that experience when I was studying A level history myself so thank you ever so much for your time today um, and thank you to all of the students and teachers who've taken part as well for your fantastic questions that you've sent in really thought-provoking and challenging questions so thank you for, you know to you as well and I think we'd both like to wish you all the very best in your studies and we'll definitely be keeping our eyes open you know to see where the future um, research comes from um, from you so all the best to you all and thank you Miranda and we're going to say goodbye now. So thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Goodbye.